Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today on this very special show is Christian Harlock. <laughs> My lord, what a show it is right now. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome back to Collider Movie Talk. Whew, this is going to be a barn burner. Natasha, who is joining us today? All right. Well, first of all, I feel like I'm in the presence of two celebrities <laughs> because Scott Vance is joining us today. Yes. Hooray. And we also got my main man, Roka. Wait a minute. What's up, y'all? Uh, I'm trying to say hello and welcome to Movie Talk. And I'm trying to get some words in before the Sarlacc pit of humanity talks <laughs> over here with a mouth. You know what I'm talking about. Mouth Natasha, that's that I was huge. so happy to be back here on Movie Talk for the first time in two years. Yeah. And then you toss it over to your main man. That's right. You what about what? your main man? <laughs> I'm your no. main man here of on Movie Talk. all that loyalty, that's right. you know? We ju we're just meeting right now. Yeah. But maybe, I will win you the over. Maybe twins. Maybe I will change win my you mind. over, hopefully, over the course of the next hour. All right. Yeah. All Johnny right. Roca, <laughs> yeah. I love you, brother. I love you, too. No, okay. you don't. All That's right. why I want to so, take you I, down. I yeah. know that I really feel like Mills Lane in the middle of Tyson and Holyfield here. Um, if you don't know, these two maniacs are going head-to-head -to -head tomorrow on the movie Trivia Schmodown. We'll get into that in a little bit, but they are here to talk about the movie topics. You guys are here to do the same. Please stay active in the chat room. We'll be looking. Want to hear from you guys. Got some movies. Movie news going on. Natasha, what's first? Though critics universally loathe Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, most fans, and in some cases critics, enjoyed Ben Affleck's Bruce Wayne Batman interpretation, and because of it, the demand for more Batman and Affleck is building. Many are now asking, when can we expect a solo Batman with Affleck directing and starring? According to The Hollywood Reporter, you might not have to wait much longer. William Morris Endeavor co-CEO Patrick Whitesell revealed to The Hollywood Reporter that Affleck has written a script for Batman while also revealing revealing how many films he's contracted for in the DC universe. White Cell said he's contracted to do at least Justice League 1 and 2, so at least three times wearing the cape. He says, adding, there's a script that he's written that's a really cool Batman idea, so that's out there as an option. Christian, do you think we'll be getting a Batman movie helmed by Affleck sooner rather than later? I do, actually. I think it's going to come sooner or later because the fan buzz is really starting to get behind it. This story came out for a reason. <laughs> this agent put this out there in the atmosphere for a reason. It was to say, listen, this movie is something I know the fans want. This is the guy who directed a Best Picture Oscar. This is the guy who has been really in the forefront of the creative, uh, you know, as, as far as the way he shifted his career. The way he shifted his career and became one of the top directors today, and he has written, uh, he has part, he co-wrote Argo as well too, I believe. Uh, the, well, he, he he's an Oscar winner for screenwriting. Don't yeah. forget, he yes. co-wrote Good Will Hunting right, yeah. with Matt Damon. So maybe if he does do a Batman, maybe uh, Matt Damon will play Robin. Well, <laughs> well, but, but seriously, all yeah. kidding aside, I mean, you know, you're talking about an actor who did shift away from being a tabloid magnet to becoming a, a respected and acclaimed writer, director, and I think we can all agree, uh, no matter what level we enjoyed or didn't enjoy Batman v Superman, that Ben Affleck as Bruce Wayne and as Batman was the best thing of that movie. Well, yeah, and that's what I was saying. Like, I think that for Ben Affleck to, he's going to be writing this movie. He's going, I mean, it's already written. They're going to do this film. And I also look, there's a, this p silly petition out there to get Zack Snyder off of Justice League yeah. 1 and 2. Now, Regardless of what you think, whether or not he's going to, he should be or shouldn't, the petition, let, let Warner Brothers figure it out. If Warner yeah. Brothers wants to put him on the movie, then they'll put him on the movie. If they don't, they don't. But I do think that they're going to listen to the fans, that they really want to, I think that they're going to get this movie. I think it's a good way for them to, even, even if they're going to keep Zack Snyder on Justice League 1 yeah. and 2, which I think they will, but even if they don't, to have Ben Affleck's Batman out there first, to give the, the fans a little bit of this push, I like it. What do you think? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Christian. I think I think both of you make great points because you talk about people have been talking about ba Affleck Super Batman rather since the film came out, and you're, the buzz has been growing, like you're saying. And Scott, you're right. He's really turned his life around, turned his perception in Hollywood around, yeah. and the perception of people watch these films around. So the excitement to see it is building more and more. And also, no one's mentioning, Jeremy Irons' Alfred is a fantastic yeah. companion. Yeah. And also the reason why that Batman worked, Affleck's Batman worked. And I th and uh, Terrio came in, Chris Terrio, I think his name, Chris Terrio, yeah. came in and wrote, co-wrote most of the scenes that Affleck is in with Affleck. So it's not a surprise that those scenes 
kind of stand out from the other scenes because he knows how to speak Affleck's voice and he knows how to write dialogue that works for them. So if they're going to work together on this standalone film, I think people will be nothing but excited to see it stripped away from other things. And also, it doesn't look like Snyder will be directing it. So that will also, in, well, obviously, because we're saying Affleck will direct it, it'll increase people's desire to see it. I think it. the other thing about that, I agree with you completely, <clears throat> yeah. uh, which is a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the other thing is that when Ben Affleck directed The Town and he directed Gone Baby oh, yeah. Gone, he can go gritty. Yeah. And while Very the gritty. critics may not have loved Batman v Superman, a lot of the fans did. There was a real disconnect between what the fans liked and what the critics liked right. and I feel like there was a lot of pouncing on Batman v Superman but I, I thought it was okay I yeah. didn't hate it uh, but I certainly didn't love it but again for, Bat for Ben Affleck to stand out as Bruce Wayne and as Batman bodes well and I think that they should give him a good standalone movie as Batman before they move on with Justice League so do you think this thing's going to happen before Justice League you think it will happen and do you think that this was kind of put out there because the agent was like, hey, we should make this happen. Yeah. Right. Well, they're pouncing on the buzz around Ben Affleck as Batman. Yeah. Also, he's he's done directing uh, Lit by Night, right. which is his next directorial effort, which I think opens in 2017. So the door is wide open for him to squeeze in a standalone movie as Batman. And regardless of, of how much I liked or had issues with Batman yeah. v Superman, a standalone movie with Affleck as Batman. I mean, I thought he was great. So yeah, yeah I'll I, see that. I also think I also think it's a smart move by them because yeah, they can say they don't like the you know the, the critics don't matter, the fans matter, all this jazz. But truth is, there are a lot of fans who hated the movie. Yeah. And so why not bring them back under the tent and give them something that they can be excited about going into Justice League? Yeah. Especially because the rumors are that Superman might be the villain in Justice League initially. So if that's what they're going to play at, you really want to set up something stronger <clears throat> as Batman, the leader of the Justice League and get the fans back in it and excited to see the next installment. All right. You want to wash that taste out of their mouth. All right, what's next? December <laughs> is fast approaching and many Star Wars fans are frothing at the mouth hoping for a look at the Star Wars story anthology movie Rogue One. While there's still no word on when we might get our first look, there's another story most fans always talk about when discussing the spin-offs: That of an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie or trilogy with Ewan McGregor back under the Jedi robes. Our very own Steve Frosty Weintraub sat down with McGregor to talk about about his latest movie, Miles Ahead, and asked about the possibility of McGregor returning to the Star Wars universe and giving fans what they want. McGregor also wants to return, saying, I'd very much like to do one, two. I think the story between episode three and four, I think there's a story there. I think that the Obi-Wan Kenobi movie, if there is one, the one that bridges my Obi-Wan Kenobi and Alex Obi-Wan Kenobi, because there is a, I don't know how long he's in the desert there, but it's got to be 20 or 30 years. When pressed if he has met with Lucasfilm about the proposed movie, McGregor played coy saying, I'm not sure I'm at liberty to say, oh. but I'm very interested in doing that. That would be great. Maybe there's even a trilogy. Mance, are you hoping to see an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie or trilogy with Ewan McGregor? I would definitely be down for a movie. And if that first movie is good, then yeah, bring on the trilogy. Because I think we can all agree that the best thing about the prequels, I know... Fellas, you're big Star Wars fans, but the best thing about the prequels was Ewan McGregor's yeah. performance, especially in the third <laughs> film, Revenge of the Sith. Now, when I interviewed uh, when I interviewed McGregor for Miles Ahead, uh, just like Frosty did, of course, I brought up the same thing. And when I asked him, "Did you see The Force Awakens?" and he was like, "Yeah, I loved it. It was really, really great." So then I just led into, "What about a standalone movie as Obi Wan?" He said, "Oh, I'd be all for it." So yes, he's. I'm sure a lot of us are asking the same questions here, but. He just elevated. He made those prequels better than they than they than they were, especially Revenge of the Sith. What do you think? Buddy? Well, well, wait. So for for you and McGregor, um, he. Well, I watched this interview that he did with Frosty too, and because a lot of people have been asking him about this, but I thought what was very interesting was how many times he said, "I'm not at liberty to say. Mm -hmm. I'm not at liberty to say," which means. He has been meeting with them, and it, it, look, this thing, the Ewan, the Ewan McGregor Obi-Wan Kenobi movie has been teased for years. When they announced that they were going to do these standalone movies, it was always about, oh, Obi-Wan, that's going to be a standalone yeah. movie. Or this, And then there was the rumors of the Obi-Wan, John Favreau directing it, and then there was potentially he was going to be a Force Ghost in 8, which I thought 
which kind of makes sense. If you watch that interview with Frosty, he's asked about um, episode eight and being a force ghost. He's like, well, to be completely honest, I have not talked to them about that. I don't know how that would work. But then when he talked about the standalone stuff, he's like, I think it should happen. And then when it was rumored in the beginning, how many times a trilogy, trilogy, he kept saying, oh, it should be a trilogy. It should be a trilogy. I think he sat down, had the meetings, and they talked about a trilogy. Yeah. He wants to do it. It's not like, oh, yeah, sure, I do it. It's like, he wants to play Obi-Wan again. I want him to play Obi-Wan yeah. again. You guys, I'm sure, want him to play Obi-Wan again. It is such a must happen. Bef get rid of the Boba Fett idea. We don't need a Boba Fett standalone movie. We need a Boba Fett Netflix Agreed. series, maybe. We don't need one of those right now, but a in between between episode three and episode four to find out what the hell Obi-Wan was doing in between that time and to have Ewan McGregor do it again. I'm all for it. Yeah, me too. I think it's a fantastic idea. And I think if people uh, if remember, I was on Jedi Council like a year and a half or a year ago where I made the pitch to have an Obi-Wan movie, Obi-Wan trilogy to you and yep. Ellis. And yep. I, it's certainly been something that I think all of us who are Star Wars fans certainly want to see because we loved his interpretation of Obi-Wan Kenobi so much. And he's been dropping this hint through all of his interviews, how he wants to do it, how he's all for it. This is the first time recently that he started to say, I'm not at liberty to say, which means you're right, Christian. He has been negotiating with them and I don't want to bring up Scott's q and I I don't want to you know he, he he likes to talk about all the things he does but like what the other thing but I what I do I'm enjoy proud. what I do enjoy <laughs> is that uh, other people are talking to him as well of just as much note like our, our friend Frosty and doing these conversations with him and getting these kinds of answers that we really need to hear from him to get us all excited and it's smart these are like trial balloons you know like uh like our previous story with Affleck all that coming out these are trial balloons to see how the public reacts and I think they've sent up enough of these through these interviews that we are totally on board. I don't 100% agree with Christian about not having a Boba Fett movie as a personal favorite of mine. I'd love to see that. But your logic is absolutely correct. This is the more main character that people, that people love. And people want to see a little, people who love the prequels want to see something that connects the prequels to the, the new universe. And this is a perfect way to do it. Scott? Just like they're doing with Rogue One, which yeah. opens in December. That's going to tie episode three to episode four as they're like, you know, hunting down the, the plants to the rebel base or yeah. to the, the plants to the Death Star. So they're clearly, they're looking to expand the Star Wars cinematic universe. Yeah. Who better to do that than one of the most iconic characters in the entire Star Wars canon, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Gil McGregor, I mean, he'd be great. Yeah, yeah I, I, it's just something I'm, I'm very curious to see how they're going to make it work and whether or not it's going to be announced anytime soon. But look, you guys, I'm reading all the comments, too. And let me know. Just You want to do yes or no? Let's do yes or no. Should an Obi-Wan movie be the next movie after young Han Solo? Should Do you guys want to see that or do you want to see something else? Just let, let me know here. And then after the next topic, we will read all those comments to see what you guys out there are saying. Now it's time for buy or sell. If you don't know how it works, Natasha's going to read out some more topics in the world of the movie news, and we're going to say whether we buy it or sell it. Natasha, what's up first? Oscar Isaac had his biggest year ever starring in Star Wars The Force Awakens and Alex Garland's amazing directorial debut, Ex Machina. Now, according to the tracking board, Garland and Isaac are looking to re-team in Garland's next sci-fi film entitled Annihilation. Garland's movie will be an adaptation of the first volume of Jeff Vandermeer's Southern Reach series of novels that will also star Natalie Portman, who was cast earlier this year. They are joined by Jennifer Jason Lee, Creed's Tessa Thompson, and Jane the Virgin's Gina Rodriguez. John Byer sell Oscar Isaac and Alex Garland's next sci-fi movie. I couldn't buy this more. Man, I, me too. I, I'm absolutely... We'll get to you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't buy this more. I, so absolutely, I, I absolutely love this idea because Ex Machina is one of these films that completely got looked over by the Academy and it shouldn't have been. It should have been one of the top 10 nominees. Al Alicia Vikander should have been nominated for this performance. And Oscar Isaac, his dance sequence is one of those things that people will remember from that movie forever. And I think Garland did a fantastic job with that. And they seem to have a great relationship. And you want to see that with actor and directors. You want to see them have a connection yep. so they can bring that to the screen and get the most out of each other. And I think we have that with that connection. And it's such a great story. It's a four-person four -person mission exploring a mysterious zone called Area X over the course of a few days. Uh, I, I, Russell Brandom at The Verge described it as a perfect, simple sci-fi premise. And Vandermeer, uses it to explore really strange ideas about consciousness, science, and psychological control without ever straying too far from the basic question of what the hell is going on in this area. And uh, it's awesome to see Padme 
and Poe Dameron in a movie <laughs> together. Right, that would be call. so awesome. And Jennifer Jason Lee is fantastic. Off of coming off of of uh, Hateful uh, Eight, Hateful Eight. Helping, Cre- helping out there, buddy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Tessa Tom, <laughs> it was coming to me. Uh, Tessa Thompson uh, was great in Creed. I thought she was a revelation in Creed. And of course, Gina Rodriguez has been talked about numerous times with the Star Wars stuff. So I think it's a fantastic cast and a great story. Can I'm I say totally. Yeah, we'll just wait till Christian. Okay, Christian. go ahead. Yeah. I'm totally. I'm totally <laughs> on board for this. Well, I buy it. Huge buy for me. Um, Alex Garland is a dude that. I'm so glad that he's getting this kind of recognition yeah. and getting these type of opportunities because I'm with you, man. Ex Machina was my t- number one movie of all of last year. Wow. I loved wow. that film. It blew me away. I think it got a little more recognition than... I, it, it, it got it, it got some it got some love. It should have been um, a best pictures. Without, I, my I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. Um, yeah. It absolutely should have. I think mm-hmm. what hurt it also came out so early yeah. as well too. But yes, it, it was a great movie. And I think that one of the things that clearly this cast shows is that the talent also recognizes what kind of movie that mm-hmm. was. And then you want to have Oscar Isaac, who's like, yeah, of course I'm going to work with this guy again. And then you have Natalie Portman, um, who, when Natalie Portman is locked into a certain project, she's one of the best out mm-hmm. there. It's just sometimes she's one of those actresses that can phone it in here and there, but I don't think that this is one of those projects that that's going to happen. Um, and then, yeah, like you said, like Creed was was something else. Tess Thompson, the way that she was... I, I really I really enjoyed I got to talk to her in Philly and sit nice. down and, and have a conversation about how she's just a really kind of giving fun person you saw that in creed the way she's she mm-hmm. just with her performance so i want to see what else she's able to do and accomplish because i'm also i'm really pitching that alex garland's eventually going to um direct a star wars film oh yeah and he's and he's still playing in the sci-fi wow. realm here so to see i think that eventually this is this is to me what a really good what a great director does it's hitting these smaller projects uh, or just kind of one-upping the project from the next to getting the, the public to go, oh, yeah, I saw that small movie. I love that one. Oh, I saw that a little bit of bigger of a movie, and I really enjoyed that one in the cast. And then when he gets that big project, you go, well, of course. Right. Look, he wasn't just given it. He had to earn it. And that's what Garland's doing right now. And this project seems to me like a something I really want to see. Scott, do you buy or sell this? I buy it 100% just like you guys do. You know, Alex Garland as a director, obviously Ex Machina. I agree with you. I wish it would have gotten nominated for Best Picture at least, but it did win the Oscar for special effects yes. right. over Star Wars, oh, right, right. which was Pretty one of shocking. the three big upsets of that night. I mean, I was a, it was a happy upset because it was so great to see the Academy show love to a movie that cost around $15 million to make and have those special effects get honored over something like Star Wars. Yeah. And, I, you know, you know, now that you talk about it, Garland directing a Star Wars right? movie or a spinoff makes makes perfect sense, especially mm-hmm. if he does it with Oscar Isaac. Yeah. But you're also yes. neglecting to talk about Alice Garland as a writer, as a right. screenwriter. Right. You know, uh, Sunshine came out in 2007. Oh, and, oh yeah, he wrote know, that? It's one of Dennis' wow. favorite movies. That movie is... One of Dennis's nice. favorite sci-fi that movies. That is right. an excellent, a good excellent film, film directed yeah. by Danny Boyle. It didn't do that well at the box office, mm. but it was definitely a great science fiction movie, as was, of course, 28 Days Later, also directed by mm. Danny Boyle. It came right. out in 2002. So as a screenwriter, he's he's on a roll. And as a director, I mean, I, I also agree with you that, that when, a, when an independent film director can make a great standalone film like uh, Ryan Coogler did with Fruitvale Station, yep, right. yep. and then like their next movie is like a... a big tempo kind of film like Creed and Alice Garland topping topping Ex Machina with a big budget film is just like when Colin Trevor Trevor, Trevor yeah. Tre- yeah. you know when Trevor. he when he directed uh, uh, Jurassic World uh, well he directed Jurassic World but uh, Safety Not Guaranteed right. oh, yeah. was a low budget independent film mm-hmm. but studios were so banking on him as a director that his next movie was Jurassic World and look mm-hmm. how well that did and look and look at episode 8 director Ryan Johnson mm-hmm. yeah you have from, mm-hmm. from Brick to Looper to Looper and yeah. now to episode 8 obviously yeah. so I, I like that studios and, and certain production companies are taking um and not even necessarily risk, but they're but they're really giving they're they're recognizing the talent that comes into the the small filmmaking and seeing yeah. what. Now look, you're going to have to have a meeting with these people and say, we've got to meet with them to see if they're going to be able to handle it because there are other like look. There's a guy that did the movie Downfall, uh, Oliver oh, Hirsch. Oh, great, great film. film, great yep. film, amazing. And they, you keep using that scene over and over again yeah. from <laughs> with, with the Hitler scene about getting overreacting to everything. But he came over and after that movie which was huge and they brought him over to do Invasion and that dude couldn't handle yeah. the, big, the big budget wait movies. a minute Invasion is an underrated film no, Nicole Kidman it's, and it's uh, terrible. Daniel Craig it was, remake was, of Invasion I, by I worked Snatchers. on that movie for a long time the problems on that set the problems um, throughout mm. the entire production of it um, watching uh, again the, the amount of reshoots they had to do 
It was a mess. It's not. Listen, I, I went into this film with, with low expectations because I heard the advance buzz was not good. They didn't do a junket. They didn't do a premiere. They just sort of like dumped it out there. Went in with super low expectations. It's not a great film, but it's not a bad one either. Right. It's well, effective enough. But I think there's examples for both, right? Because James Gunn did the same thing, made the jump from smaller films into Guardians. Yeah, sure. so you yeah. made a great point, oh, yeah. Christian. But unfortunately, the, the cautionary tale is Josh Trank. You're right. There's a Josh Trank, not to put him down or anything. but He got like, beat up a little he, bit too. He yeah, did. He did. Unfairly at times, but then again, Fantastic Four didn't turn out and then he no, but I mean, he got beat it. up he got beat up a little bit by the studio as well too and that, right. that happens it also happened yeah. to um to Gavin Hood when oh, yeah, it, when Gavin you Hood, look right. like somebody who did the Satsi which is an amazing 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 film, film. Yes. Yep. and then you bring him in and he got a little beat up during Wolverine yeah. uh, Origins but uh so and but then look look at John Hillcoat you know John Hillcoat who did proposition and then um as slowly been transitioning yep. to, to the other movie so there there is a I'm very very happy that he's getting these opportunities yeah. we'll see what happens now before we go over to the next buy or sell like I said asked you guys about the Ewan McGregor Obi-Wan movie and oh, I've never seen I've asked so many questions as far as yes or no's and it's been you know maybe sometimes 75 25 this was maybe 99 percent yes 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 oh, wow. everybody wants to see it so there you go all right Natasha what's next Okay, according to a report from Deadline, Brian Cranston and Kevin Hart are circling the two leads in a remake of the French film The Intouchables. The movie about an ex-con hired to be a caretaker for an aristocrat earned $416 million at the international box office and was purchased by the Weinstein Company for the remake. Bridesmaids director Paul Feig wrote the script and was once planning to direct the film, but left the project some time ago. Deadline says the Weinstein Company is reportedly looking at director Tom Shade to helm the film, though no detail or though no deal has been made. Christian buy or sell Cranston and Hart starring in The Untouchables. I'm gonna tentatively buy it. Um, <laughs> now I know uh, 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 a name that hasn't been heard in the reviewing community in a long time uh, is Catherine Reitman, who was a buddy of ours, uh, and she. I remember she tell her telling me about The Untouchables a long time ago, how much she loved the original film, and. Um, and then to hear that Cranston and Kevin Hart are doing it, this to me, I'm assuming that that Kevin Hart is going to play the um, caretaker. The, the caretaker. Yeah. So it would I, be a flip. The ex-con it wasn't. hired to be a caretaker. Yeah, I know. And and it, it just he seems like these are the kind of the roles that he's been playing a lot of too. But what I want to see, I want to see whether or not. Their dynamic works. I'm very curious to see how the, the Rock and Kevin Hart play off one another too. It seems that like Kevin Hart just has been playing the same roles. He's in the same kind of vein of what Melissa McCarthy has been doing yeah. lately, and Will Ferrell's been doing. It's like the same thing over and over again. But to see if there's a little more drama in this as well too. But I want to see how he plays against Brian Cranston because Brian Cranston we know can play comedy, but we also know that he's a tremendous dramatic actor. So that's why I get I'm I'm optimistic that it could be a lot of fun and maybe something different for Kevin Hart. But what do you think? Okay, I'm buy with you it? on this. It's not an enthusiastic buy, but it's a buy enough. And that's solely based on my love for the original film, which came out in 2011, a French film. <laughs> you know, it's it's a little formulaic. I know, with the dates, right? I know. Uh, it's a little formulaic and cliched and contrived, but these movies, sometimes they just... They just follow the numbers and they work well. And there's a reason why it made, I think, internationally and overseas and, and worldwide total was like closer to 430 yeah, million. 400 million. It only cost like 12 million to make, uh, but it was a big hit and it's an inspiring film. It's a rousing film. It's a feel good crowd pleaser mm -hmm. in every sense of the word. Problem, Christian, is I'm with you on this. You know, Kevin Hart does keep playing the same sort of very broad characters over and over again. You know, sort of the motor mouth. You know, and I would like to see him do something a little edgier but this could be edgier because edge was something that was missing from the french film mm. i thought it just was a little too sweet a little fluffy a little fluffy yeah john i uh, i disagree i didn't think it was fluffy or uh, fluffy at all i thought it was very sweet and it's something uh i, I i'm gonna sell this only because tom shaddock has had a good film since the 90s maybe you could say because I mean uh, Bruce Almighty was probably the last thing that we right. know because Evan Almighty crashed and burned before that he had done three out of four of his best films with Jim Carrey and Jim yeah. Carrey's not in this one you know and so to me there's a lot of a worry on my side of it because I love this film so much it's really one of the most beautiful French films you're ever going to see and Omar C's performance is as the caretaker is amazing and I don't know if Kevin Hart is the right choice to go to that level yeah. and take it because nothing he's shown in any 
any of his other films. Listen, the man is a fantastic comedian. For those that love him, he's very funny and he's a hard worker. He hustles. There is nothing negative to say about Kevin Hart as a worker in this town. But my concern is the the tender moments that they had are earned and if he's going to do his shtick of flailing around and screaming really loud in certain moments it's going to kill the tender moments when they happen I, and that's what i'm concerned about so i think it's a it's a valid point but maybe cranston can drag him into a more realistic and touching performance totally valid concerns you make great points with shady as far yeah. as as far as what he hasn't done anything in a while that has warranted the yeah excitement yeah. for it so i i think that your points are are actually perfect as far as why you would want to sell this thing um and you should especially if you're a lover of this particular film but i think that i think the main concern right now is whether or not kevin hart can yeah. pull it off yeah so we'll see um some of the comments is uh, i guess phat fat girl love a 68 the last og says um i'll put this on layaway um, okay, a lot of people are saying the same thing in regards to Kevin Hart. Seems like he's doing the same shtick. Maybe he can make he might be a surprise here, but I don't think it's going to happen. It's a hard yeah. sell. I buy Cranston, but I sell Hart. If that's the problem with being overexposed. Yeah. I think that event, if it's one of those things that happens is when you're out there too much doing a lot of the same stuff, like I mentioned before, the Melissa McCarthy or yeah. Kevin Hart, the fans are saying Give me a break for now, unless you prove us otherwise. I think Michael B. Jordan in this film with, with Cranston would have killed it. Oh, oh Michael yeah. B. Jordan would be great. It to a yeah, whole yeah. Level. now there's yeah. good or, casting. Or Nate Parker, too. Nate Parker. Uh, Nate Parker, Nate Parker yeah, sure. as well, too. Um, okay, Natasha, what's next? In a report from Variety, Jonah Hill will make his directorial debut in the upcoming age drama dramedy called Mid-90s based on a spec script he wrote. Plot details are still unclear, though. Variety does say the movie is set to follow a young boy in Los Angeles in the mid-1990s who learns life lessons while hanging out with his crew of skateboarding friends. Also interesting, Hill will not be acting in this, opting only to stay behind the camera. No release date has been announced. Mance, buy or sell Jonah Hill stepping behind the camera for mid-90s. I'm going to say buy because here's an actor who is breaking away from his comfort zone. He is a two-time Oscar nominee as an actor. Who would have thought watching Superbad <laughs> that Jonah Hill would get nominated for an Oscar twice yeah. for Wolf of Wall Street and Moneyball? Now... He is also a writer. He co-wrote 21 Jump Street, which was more than just a comedy. It was very <laughs> clever, and it was very smart, and also very, very funny. Now, this movie is mid-90s, is being pitched as a dramedy, so it does have comedy, which is where he excels. And if he can stretch himself as an actor, he's already a good writer. I'm actually going to buy him as a director. And I think the fact that he's not starring in the film, that he's just going to focus on behind the camera, is a smart move because you know it is a lot to take on when you're directing yourself and also acting in a film. I completely agree with you, man. So I think this is a big buy for me for those reasons. Um, and I'll, I'll throw you one even a little farther back. Who would have thought that that kid trying to buy the eBay stuff, a 40-year-old virgin, would have been an Oscar winner? Uh, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like, and look, and I, I have had my thoughts on Jonah Hill. Like for uh, he Between him, uh, his co-star in 21 Jump Street, Chine Tatum, and Shia LaBeouf, um, I have had switches in my opinions of them. Mm -hmm. Because for me, for a long time, Jonah Hill was just doing the same kind of awkward guy who, oh, touch your face and get a laugh <laughs> like that to a guy who was one of my favorite things about wolf of wall street mm -hmm. was great in Moneyball, and is making the right choices in his career he sees the end game you know he sees like what he wants to do in his career it's not just about well i got to be in another comedy to pay the bills what can i do honestly about my legacy like, what do i want to do what do i want my career to be and directing seems to be something that he wants to do he's a very smart guy this is the story he wants to tell i think it's brilliant that he's not in front of the camera i think a lot of times that the not, nothing against the actors who decide that they want to direct for the first time and then go well i'm going to be in it too to, to kind of to sell it with my name he wants to direct yeah. what he wants to do and maybe he's be, turns out to be a guy like Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck was not in his first film, Gone yeah. Baby Gone. He was not in the movie. Put his brother Excellent in it. Excellent point. Great. Excellent and, point. And that's the thing. He was in. Didn't need to be. And I think that he's taking a page out of of Ben Affleck's book, and he's doing that. Now, look, he might be a horrendous director. We don't know. Mm. But I like the choice, so that's why I'm buying it. John. Right. Yeah, absolutely buying it as well. I think it's. I think this is a logical next step for him as he's been progressing over the last few years as an actor, as a writer, as a as a presence in Hollywood. It mm -hmm. just makes sense. If it he does. wants to try this, why not? Yeah. Sometimes you worry when an actor just steps up. And wants to direct a film you think that's ego but I think with him this is more of his his exploration of his talent and his abilities and I think this is the right thing to do it's a script he wrote so they always say write what you know and I think it's interesting that it's kind of full circle because he played the character that Seth Rogen wrote 
for Superbad, he's essentially playing Seth Rogen. So I imagine whoever he's going to cast in this film is playing essentially Jonah Hill. Yeah. So it's a way to kind of bring it full circle and kind of maybe put that away and move on to the next thing. So I'm excited. I think he's actually really funny. And he is, like you were saying, Christian, absolutely agree with you. He has won me, won me over a lot with his drama work in Moneyball and in, in uh, Wolf of Wall Street. And also, you've always, even in Superbad, there are moments of real desire to connect and tenderness amidst all the gross out humor that he plays really well. You know, the moments with Emma Stone are very well done. Mm -hmm. And when he's carrying Michael Sarah, yeah, it's ridiculous, but you believe him. Yeah. And I think I want to see a script and I want to see a film from a guy like this. I want to give it a chance and we should uh, give those kinds of uh, films a chance in this town. And I think the other thing about Jonah Hill is that in the, in the movies where he was nominated, Moneyball and Wolf of Wall Street, yeah. they weren't straight ahead dramatic roles. There was humor right. to them. He yeah. was almost like the comic relief in both of those films, but they were more dramatic than anything yeah. he's ever done. And I like what you've said about write what you know. Yeah. It's not like he's going on to direct Star Wars Episode Nine, right, right, <laughs> you right. know, or something but but, like I mean, that. But look, who who knows? That's my point yeah. with Ben Affleck. Oh, I wait mean, a minute! <laughs> but, but this, but this, Don't give I'm, anybody any ideas. What I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, is that you get a guy again bringing up the point with Ben Affleck. Yeah. If I would have told you that, you know, what was 2007 was Gone Baby Gone? If yeah. I would have told you in 2006 yeah. that in about 10 years from now. Ben Affleck is going to be up for directing a Batman film. You'd be like, get out of here. Yeah. What, are you, what are you trying to do? Nolan is God. Get out of here. Everyone wants Affleck to do it now because yeah. of the three films that he's done beforehand. So right. not that Jonah Hill's ever going to do that, but I, you just you just never know. You well, never know. And, and, you make a great, and Ben directed what he knew. Boston. This is yep. what he knows. Right. So logically. Yep. You know, and his, and his next point. project's going to be in Boston yeah. also, too. All right, Natasha, what's what's next? Max Landis continues his hot streak of new movies coming to the screen with incredible talent attached thanks to an article from The Wrap. Fresh off his deal with David Ayer and Netflix for the supernatural cop thriller Bright, Landis has another script ready to go with Bradley Cooper now attached to Star. The drama Deeper has set white god director Cornell Mondrusco to helm the project with Landis producing alongside David S. Goyer. The story revolves around a disgraced astronaut who sets out on a mission to the bottom of a newly discovered oceanic trench, which is believed to be the lowest point on Earth. In the face of grave danger, he quickly finds himself in a physical and psychological fight against mysterious forces. Still no word on a production start date or release. John Byer saw Bradley Cooper and Max Landis's next drama, Deeper. I absolutely buy this. I, I think it's the perfect timing for for, for Cooper to take on a project like this. And Max Landis, who was a friend of the Schmoes, know we all, you know, you can feel however you feel about him, positive or negative, the guy is really smart about what he knows. And he, the fact that he was able to create this bidding war for his, for Bright to, to blow the doors off that, and then to move on to something that's probably a little bit, maybe a little bit more smaller, deeper, or more intense, I think it's a great next step for him. And I like the idea, because Cooper's kind of needed something over the last couple of years. Limitless was maybe kind of the last thing that people liked him for burnt kind of crashed and burned and there hasn't been much where he's shown up and and like really taken it by the reins and American we, Sniper who, oh, American oh yeah Sniper. American Sniper sorry American but Sniper. okay that's a good point sorry Scott yeah. yeah and so yeah so that's a good okay so this would be nice to but that's been over a year right so it's like we're waiting for the next thing and I and I would like to see I think this is a great thing for him uh and he's the thing about Max is because of his pedigree is very knowledgeable about the business and he's been working on numerous other scripts script doctoring through the time. So this is going to be fun to see what he can create. And I like the plot. Uh, Goyer, I'm always kind of half and half on Goyer because sometimes he really nails it and sometimes he just kind of misses. But I think it's a good combination of people and the script and the idea. And it's got shades of the abyss. And I love the abyss. It's one of yeah, the most unrecognized. Underrated uh, movie. Yeah, underrated films from James Cameron. And I think it has that shade to it. And I'd like that to go back. And this director is fantastic. If you haven't seen White Dog, it's such a great um, analogy for classism through the eyes of dogs. And they, you, he uses dogs in a very quiet way that they turn on the people who are subjugating them and they explores classism in society. It's such a brilliant way to do it. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm going to buy it too. And I say this as a compliment. Max Landis is a lunatic. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and in the best way, like, because like, the guy is, when you hear him talk, about regardless of what, yeah, is is he kind of a polarizing figure? Yeah, is, yeah. is he someone who is controversial? Yeah, past that, past him when he's when he's talking about Mary Sue's and all that stuff. Past that stuff, <laughs> the guy when you hear him talk about ideas, yeah. that is a his talent is incredible. He said you're talking about when he was on our show, yeah. just the stuff that he was pitching 
that he was coming up with at the top of his head. Whatever you think about him, the guy sells scripts every other Tuesday. He is selling a new script. And that's not just a matter of them going, oh, this is Max Landis, buy the script. There's got to be something behind it. The yeah. fact that it's his, there's creative. I liked American Ultra. A lot of people didn't like it. Um, the, Mr. Wright looks really cool. Yeah. Um, the, every five seconds, he's got a new movie coming out yeah. because it's not just the same genre. It's not just the same thing. You look, you hear this about the the astronaut thing, and hearing what Bradley Cooper's going to do, and him working with, um, you know, to to hear was working with Goyer, and just what he's going to be doing, and the amount of relationships that he has, and the way that he's able to pitch, and the way that he's be able to get people excited about projects. That's why I buy it because there's always something new with him. It's not the same thing. So even mm -hmm. if you might have a miss, I want to see what's coming next because yeah. he's just in his head. You mentioned the abyss. I guarantee you he was thinking about the abyss yeah. when he wrote this movie. I guarantee you his knowledge of film. You talk about somebody I want on a movie trivia schmodown. It's Max Landis. <laughs> no. I want to see that guy go after a but because there's just so much in there that he gets out on paper. There's so mm -hmm. many writers out there that is just in there and it's like, oh, what if I did a movie about this? And then, oh, I remember that movie. He puts it on paper. And then he sells the, the yeah. he sells the thing. So, buy for me, uh -huh. buy for me too. And it, like, I never met Max Landis, but I've seen pictures, and I know he was on the Schmodown. I know he's done movie fights for Screen Junkies. I hear a lot that he's like a younger version of me. Is that true? Um, I don't know yet. I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out, man. So uh, I think you're more. I think you got a Hal Rudnick thing. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Can you imagine the three yeah. of us? You know, to, to a movie talk. Yeah, I'm Hal Rudnick. Yeah. You know, Max All Landis and Nance. But uh, no, I think uh, Bradley Cooper is. I I think he's just making great choices. Yeah. I loved. I really, really loved American Sniper. Yeah. But you know, all the stuff he's done with David O. Russell. Uh, you know, uh, American Hustle, and I know that Joy got very mixed reviews, but yeah. I like Joy a lot, and I thought that he was really good in it as the uh, the Home Shopping Network uh, mm -hmm. guru. And uh, you know, I don't really know a lot about Max Landis uh, other than he's a very prolific writer and has a lot of ideas and is a bit of a lunatic, like yeah. you said, mm -hmm. but, in the best uh, way possible. <laughs> uh, I think Bradley Cooper is impressive the way he is broken out from being like the cool mm -hmm. dude in the Hangover movies. He is an actor who is challenging himself, and uh, you know, I'll see basically anything he yeah, does. And people forget he's the villain in uh, the the wedding movie, the Wedding Crashers. Oh yeah, people forget he's, the, he's such yeah, a jerk he's in, in that uh, movie. Guardians the of the Galaxy. He was a uh, yeah, and, you know, one of the yeah, so, um, okay, we're going to move on here, but before we do it, we're talking about Max Landis, and why not do this? This will be a lot of fun. For you guys, we want to see him on the Movie Trivia Showdown. Go ahead and tweet him. Why not? <laughs> At Up to My Knees, I believe, is his Twitter yep. handle. Tell up him that you want to see him on hashtag Schmodown, and then I guarantee he's going to be like, what, what, you getting nervous? Oh, perfect. I, oh, I would. You should be nervous. I would be nervous about you Max should be, Landis. Don't be nervous about Max Landis. Yeah, I'd be nervous, be nervous about, about, him. about Movie Mance. No, please. Be nervous about this guy. It's like being nervous about You're a fly. You're lucky that this guy is sitting right between us, or else yeah. it would get ugly. Oh, would it? Yes. All right, take it easy. Okay, so <laughs> go, <laughs> and, go. Relax. We got some time. Go and tweet at, at Max Landis at up to my to tell him we want to see test his movie knowledge, see how it is, and, and participate in the game. Okay, now we are going to get to opening this week, brought to you by our friends over at AMC Theaters. A couple movies coming out. It's, a, it's not the big. Big release weekend this weekend, but we have some cool ones coming out. What do we got? Okay, coming out miles ahead in the 1970s, down and out jazz trumpeter Miles Davis tries to re recover his new session tape from music producers. The film is written, directed, and stars Don Cheadle as Miles Davis with Emma Yatsi, Cora Nialdi, and Ewan McGregor. And also coming out is God's Not Dead 2. When a high school teacher is asked a question in class about Jesus, her reasoned response lands her in deep trouble and could expel God from the public square once and for all. The film stars Jesse Metcalf, Metcalf, David A.R. White, Ray Wise, and Robin Gibbons. So I'm going to throw it to the movie man. Okay. I know you've seen you've seen Miles Ahead. I saw Miles Ahead twice. It's Sundance, right? I saw it at well, I saw it at the New York Film Festival back in September, and I saw it again at Sundance. And I like this movie a lot because a movie called Miles Ahead. This is a film that that Don Cheadle wrote, yeah. directed, produced, and stars as Miles Davis, and he is sensational. It's not what you think it is. It is not a cradle to the grave biopic. It focuses on a specific period of his life in the mid 70s when he was living as a recluse. He was lost. He was very paranoid mm -hmm. and definitely had a massive, massive ego. And Mew McGregor plays a reporter from Rolling Stone magazine who is trying to interview him, who may or may not have an ulterior motive for being there. And it also has flashbacks back to the 50s when, when Miles Davis was really at the top of his game. 
So in some ways, it felt a little like Love and Mercy, the movie about Brian Wilson, only in this case, Don Cheadle is playing uh, Miles Davis in both in both periods. But because it is not a traditional biopic, because it does focus on one period of his life, it's amazing that you actually learn more about him through this process. This is a very engaging film. Uh, I was blown away by Don Cheadle's performance mm -hmm. as as Miles Davis. How, how I, was Emmy Oscar worthy? Emmy Yatsi Karen Let me tell you something about her. She was in a movie a few years ago called Middle of Nowhere, the second film written and directed by Ava DuVernay, who did who did Selma. Yeah. She was terrific in that. She is a standout as in the, in this film as well, and uh, I I she should definitely be a much much bigger actress than she is i think she will be she yeah. should be yeah. she's fantastic in this movie to hold her own with a towering presence yeah. like don Cheadle right. is not an easy task um, i say see this movie <laughs> yeah and roko out of the two movies that, that we're talking about here which one would you be up for seeing uh absolutely miles ahead i've been waiting for this one for a long time yeah. there's no bigger miles fan in this room than miles davis fan than me oh is that Bitches right Bitches brew nefertiti Birth of the Cool, Born to be Blue, these are all the most, I'm telling you, Miles Davis. Kind of is, blue. Kind of blue, right. Born to Blue is Chet Baker. That's what I was, because oh. I was about to. I'm just saying. I was oh. about to make the, I know you, I know you need to put your ego out there. I, I was going <laughs> to make the correction in just a second, because I went yeah, to sure see. Yes, sure you are. Um, okay. Because I went to see Born to be Blue yesterday. That was good. And that's what, yeah, uh, yeah. Let me get to, yeah. So anyway, uh. I'm saying it's, it's very, both of these movies are very similar in that they are slices of each of these great yes. jazz musicians' lives. Born to be Blue is about, once again, this later time in Chet Baker's life when he's trying to put himself together and figure out what's going on after he's got his teeth punched out, which really did happen. And then Miles Davis, it sounds like from what Scott's describing, it's later in his life in the 70s yep. when he is almost like James Brown-esque, that kind of paranoid near the end of, of his of his life and before he comes back and does the Arsenio Hall appearances and does these things where he kind of reclaims his presence. And I think this is fantastic because there is no more polarizing, interesting, insane, phenomenal figure in jazz than Miles Davis. Yeah. And so to have someone who is someone like Don Cheadle who has the level of talent that people do not respect enough uh, tackle him and show what he can do just in the trailer alone, I am going out of my mind to see this movie. And I like that it's not a cradle to the grave biopic, like yep. you said, because that would take hours. Well, yeah, it well, would. The hell with you guys. Robin Givens is back, baby. <laughs> uh, no, I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on Miles Ahead. I, uh, I want to see this movie. I, I didn't get to see it in Sundance. Um, um, but I absolutely want to see it, and I think that to see the passion that went in to this uh, by Don Cheadle yeah. and the fact that um, you have so who's who else is who's the um, there's there's Don Cheadle obviously there's Emiati you and McGregor, McGregor and then, yeah but then who's the other the kid that was in Selma and he was there, there was a, there's another kid in that movie I got to get his name but he's a he is a great he played he played Snoop in um, in in Compton, out of Compton. Anyway, that, that, that guy's another one. You're talking about an underrated actor. I can't remember the, the guy's name, but we will because he's, he's in a tremendous talent. Keith yes, Stanfield? Keith Stanfield, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Keith Stanfield is a guy to look out for. I was able to speak to him at Sundance, and the, he's, he, I was really blown away by his... I haven't seen that film yet, but everything he's done so far, I uh, loved him in Selma, so I want to see what he's going to do. Now, as far as God's Not Dead too, I really this thing's under the radar for me. I don't know enough of you. What, what's wrong? Well, the trailer is, listen... Awful? I, uh, so awful. Okay. And because it's simple. It's lifetime. It's not... Listen, I don't want to get to... You know, because this is a very tender, t sensitive issue, so I understand. I'm a, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. Um, but some of these films that played to the base, the lowest base intelligence bothers me because it doesn't allow for actual discussion of these very difficult and uh, sensitive topics, real discussion. What you have when you see in the trailer is Melissa Joan Hart saying the word Jesus in a classroom and all of a sudden the school administrators put on their horns and grab their pitchforks and go after her and that's not what really happens. There's, there's In real life there is serious issues between constantly teaching God and Christianity in public schools, it makes other people who believe in different religions or different branches of Christianity feel lesser than. And if you're going to say freedom of religion, you have to allow for everything. So the best way to allow for everything is not to push one particular agenda. So you're so, looking forward to the movie? Yeah, yeah so much. Uh, so, <laughs> can't so, wait. I yeah. just, you know, it just bothers me this stuff because I yep. think there is real issues to be explored here, and I want a more intelligent film to do that because the point they're making 
is a valid point. I just want to see it explored yeah. more intelligently. Totally. Okay. Um, well, that's it in regards to what's coming out this week. So let's now we're gonna normally we do we do mailbag. We're gonna hear from you guys, but obviously we're gonna do the live questions as far as Twitter goes. So you make sure that you go to at Collider Video. One of the things I like to see, and Natasha is gonna be the gatekeeper. Make sure I want to see at least one or two questions about these two going at it. I want to see what <laughs> hashtag it schmo, uh, schmo down, by the way, too, and ask one of them a question. You want uh, Trust me, they'll talk smack on one another if you ask the right question. So <laughs> throw a couple out there, but also what do you guys, what else do you want to talk about? Natasha's a gatekeeper, but first, a couple mailbags. What do we got first? Mark Gilherm writes, Hey Collider, just started watching a few weeks ago, but now I'm a daily listener. With all of the mentions of Lex Luthor Sr. and Batman v Superman, and considering audience reactions to Jesse Eisenberg's portrayal, do you think we could see Warner Brothers casting an older actor in the senior role and using that character for future films? Thanks. Um, do I think that there was a little bit, like most people, including myself, I didn't love... I'll go back. When when I heard that Ben Affleck was cast as Batman, and I was, this is a bad idea. Shouldn't mm -hmm. happen. So mm -hmm. I don't want to see Ben Affleck. Just stick to directing. I don't want to see him as Batman. And I was completely wrong. Best thing about the entire mm -hmm. movie, he was great. And I started getting more excited about it over the last year mm -hmm. once I saw more images of him and hearing more about him and and realizing kind of where he's come in his career. And and I I would say I was dead wrong. I felt the same way when I heard Jesse Eisenberg was cast as Lex Luthor and. Did not change my opinion. I didn't um, like him as Luther. So I just didn't think he fit, especially after hearing that they were going to put uh, Brian Cranston mm. as Lex Luthor at one point, which I thought would have been. Look, they take a, they took a shot. They took a shot and they, they went after a different Lex Luthor and, and more power to him. That's the vision that they saw and they wanted to go with it. I didn't particularly like it. That being said, they're not going to re recast him. Not going to happen. I don't care if and I wouldn't want them to recast him. That even even saying that Jesse Eisenberg to me was not a great Lex Luthor. I would not want to see him recast. I think it takes out. I was upset when Omar Epps replaced Wesley Snipes in Major League Two. <laughs> so I don't want to see an actor that was already. I know him as the character. In this universe, Jesse Eisenberg, take it or leave it, is Lex Luthor. But wait a minute. When they recast Iron Man uh, in Iron Man. I they, know. D they, they Don had, Cheadle. They had Don Cheadle. That, that, I didn't blink an eye. Different, I thought though. he was great. D I, I don't disagree Rhodes. with you. Different scenario, though. Why? Why? Because Ter because Terrence wanted, he wanted more money. More money. Right. So that's a different thing. This oh, is I not. See. This is not the fans going. Get him out of there. We want Don Cheadle. Jesse Eisenberg doesn't want to go anywhere. He I, wants to play this character, and I he shouldn't be able to. But you know what? Jesse Eisenberg did not do it for me. I'm not disagreeing there. Luthor. Yeah. I thought someone like Mark Strong would have been a great Lex Luthor. Sure. And I, I don't know if it's if that would. But ever do you happen. think they're going to replace him? But no, 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 I don't. Yeah. I mean, they won't replace him. John, because uh, I think that he did actually get pretty decent reviews, but he just didn't do it for me. Well, I think this is interesting because they never call him Lex in the movie. They call him Alexander Luther in the movie. They almost never call him Lex. He's Lex point. Jr. He's Lex Jr. Yeah. So the possibility, they don't say his dad is dead. They don't say anything. So the possibility is that Cranston is still Lex Luther. Hmm. This guy is just his son. And so it's it kind of makes sense a little bit. It could play. Yeah, because, a bit of a cop out, though. Well, yes, but Batman's also older in this universe, whereas Superman is younger. So you're playing with ages all over the place if they do that i will accept this idea if cranston comes back and does it i i, I mean I, I i wouldn't like them to recast because they've already it, it would show a backtracking and once you start that then you're saying oh yeah our vision was wrong and I, snyder doesn't strike me as the kind of person who would accept that willingly um I, I, it's interesting some people really loved him i've talked to a few people that loved eisenberg's performance which i did not i agree with people who didn't so i just I, thought he was a more annoying version of mark zuckerberg right I mean, yeah. it was very Mance esque of what but, I saw uh, when I was well, watching it. I don't so. blame, but I don't blame Eisenberg for that because that that was the character they told him to play. Well, the rumor is that they he was supposed to be Jimmy Olsen. He was supposed to be Jimmy Olsen yeah. or the Riddler. Right. And then when they came back to him and offered him Luther, he said, "Well, I've already worked on the character like this, so this is the way I'm playing it." Oh, really? That's the rumor. Now, who knows if it's true? But that's the rumor, and it seems to fit from what we saw Maybe. on screen. Yeah. Yeah, but that that's when they if that's when you say if you're if it doesn't work as, yeah. as you go, <laughs> it's a retroactive go, fit. Yeah. See you on Zombieland too. Yeah. Um, okay, what's next? <laughs> okay. Bobby Hoskins writes, Hey, Collider crew, I have a feeling that Disney Lucasfilm has a big disconnect with the general moviegoers. I've heard many people who aren't stupid people, just not in the movie news sphere, say that they're excited for the new Star Wars movie because they think it's the next episode and are shocked when I tell them about Rogue One. I think Disney needs to start marketing Rogue One to get people to understand the type of Star Wars movie that it that is releasing this year. Do you as well? Thanks for everything that you do. 
Yes, and hey, Charlie Oates, get lost. Because uh, we, we, <laughs> it's like uh, there are a lot of people who do like um, the, the people who do like Lex Luthor, Jesse yeah, Eisenberg, yeah. as well too. We're very aware of that, but there's a lot of people who didn't. So yeah. I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna save my troll rant for a little later. Um, well, I said there were people that did. Yes, so. but going on to Rogue One. Rogue One to me, this is a great question because I was in Florida over the the weekend, and I was talking to my brother, who's a diehard Star Wars fan as well. And we were talking about Rogue One, and we were actually in a restaurant. And I'm looking around, I go, how many people do you think in here are aware of Rogue One, that it's the, that what Rogue One is? And he's like, in this restaurant now? He's like, 2%. He's like, maybe, wow. he's like, maybe one or two people, if you, if you walk up and ask them about what Rogue One is, right. it would they know? And I, I totally agree with him. I said, there's no way a lot of people know. And hearing that, that email or reading that email, it's the marketing hasn't hit yet. But make no mistakes about it. Come on. The second that thing starts to get the, the trailer, and they're going to market this movie with Vader. They have to market it with Vader. Yeah. It's the it's the way because the second you see Vader, you know it doesn't continue the Ray and Finn and Poe Dameron storyline. Because oh wait a minute, oh this is a different movie. That's the way you're going to sell this film is once you see Darth Vader. Now whether the first trailer is going to be uh, you know him breathing, and then the second you know you see him fighting on the on on the back battlefield or then when you see the death star it's just because we haven't you're going to see the death it's star it's just because we haven't seen anything yet but are but you going to see vader i mean what are, i mean will, will vader be in it will you hear him will you just see like a hologram of him i mean will he actually be a character will you hear the voice of james earl jones mm. those are all very good questions yeah but yes the fact that you will see the death star and I mean that's exciting. I mean right. this is right before episode four. This is that that's now that's a prequel. Yeah. Well, I think what they're pitching, uh, the idea, this the question is it's certainly a valid question as you as your brother points out, Christian. There are probably people that don't know 100 percent what Rogue One is. They think it's the next installment. Those of us who are fans, we know what it is. So they don't have to play to us or advertise to us. Just get us more excited. That's all it'll do. But the you're right, Christian. They're going to ramp up the advertising soon it's only what april it's just about to start april if the thing comes out in december right well, it's not, so i mean it's, look, it's, it's there's a valid not, rush i no, don't think it's a, a valid rush no I, there's a valid point though the fact Is that if you well look at okay. look at the force awakens right right granted that you had to get this, the people kind of flowing for star wars they put that right. first trailer out a little over a year it came out the day after thanksgiving that yeah. little teaser right, right. And we had even Ultron had something I think about maybe nine, ten months beforehand too. We're, we're approaching April here to where there's n nothing. So I understand the yeah. question as far as a movie because even Civil War yeah. has a full slate of movies that came before it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got news for you. But, I got news not to interrupt. Uh, but I'll bet you see <laughs> but to new interrupt. footage. Yeah. But to interrupt. Yeah. I'll bet you see footage for Rogue One with Captain America. Oh, absolutely. Civil War, that's, that's, that makes the most sense. Right, but, but I think, you know, I'm not denigrating the question. I think it's a valid question, yeah. absolutely. My point, my, my feeling is that Disney doesn't see this as, a, as the same kind of approach to their sure. overall trilogy, sure. which, was, which is seven, eight, and nine. Yeah. So I think they're taking this slow because they, they, the box office receipts are probably not going to rival it, so they don't have to spend the same amount of effort to make it so well known. Plus, Force Awakens already established that they can do a good movie and people can get it excited about Thank it goodness. and so they'll yeah right and so they'll <laughs> the road people are going to trust rogue one and come but i don't think they're pushing it just yet because all this other stuff's coming up and then they're going to take over the market it, and who knows if it'll work i right. mean their viral marketing worked last time all right well now it's time to hear from you guys you guys have been sending some tweets natasha has been going through them you have been submitting to at collider video natasha there's a few out there what are they saying Okay, No Pants Daniel asks, with reboots, <laughs> you love no Pants Daniel. <laughs> with reboots being seen more and more commonly, is there such a thing as a franchise too sacred to touch again? Yes. Back what is to it? the future. Don't touch it. Ooh. Back to the future. Oh, yeah. Totally agree. Do not I, touch I, back and there's been talk of Jaws. Leave Jaws alone. because Leave I, The Godfather alone. Yeah. I mean, you got two great movies and one that's meh. You take well, out Sofia Coppola. Unless it's Coppola. Yeah. If Coppola comes back. They were going to do a Godfather. Uh, well, I'm saying he's still alive. So yeah. I would be okay with Coppola coming back to do that. And a fourth one to say, I'm sorry for three. It worked out for Stallone going back and doing Balboa. Well, however you feel about Balboa. Right. But Creed really saved the franchise yeah. again. And yeah. I think there is a chance for Coppola to do this if he ever gets out of that vineyard and wants to write something really, really powerful. And there are enough good actors to do that with, you know. All right, what's next? Okay, Michael Beltran asks, what do you guys think of DC and Warner Brothers planning to do Suicide Squad reshoots to lighten the tone? Uh, listen, it's fine. Uh, that the, if, if the movie is too dark and it's going rated R, 
I mean, listen, it's it not, worked for Deadpool. It's not going on. It's not going on. It's not going on. No, but no. if it's too dark, they want to lighten the tone. You know, maybe they want to take a tone that's a little different from we have with Batman of Steel and Batman v Superman. You know, make it more fun. You know, this is an ensemble film. And listen, the new Star Trek film, Beyond, uh, just had some reshoots. And mm-hmm. the movie opens on July 22nd. <laughs> so, I know, wow. I'm a little nervous. Yeah, me too. But I'm still excited because it is the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. Yeah. And you got to release a good movie <laughs> on the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. And you know that between the three of us here, I'm probably the biggest uh, Trekker. I know you're a big Trekker too. Mm-hmm. But, I, I mean, this Trek movie has to be good. I'm not mm-hmm. going off tangent here. But yeah. I'm excited for Star Trek Beyond. What do you think? As far as I lost it because he was just talking. He went off Star on Trek. What, was, what is the question? The question we were talking about, uh, the, we did the review. Kirk versus we, Picard. No. <laughs> yeah, you went off You went off on your, on your tangent always. completely. Um, Natasha. You lost us on Star Trek. What was the question? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody lost remember. the question. Oh, I threw oh, everybody no. off. Was it about Look the that. No, Suicide Squad? Yeah, she's yeah, 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 yeah. doing reshoots. I, suicide Squad, as far as uh, how did we get into Star Trek from Suicide Squad? Um, <laughs> su- reshoots. Su- reshoots. Right. Suicide, 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 suicide Squad for me. Um, it. I think. I, I think it's a. It, it should not go into a lighter tone. I really don't think yeah. it should because I think the problem is is that one of the biggest complaints of Batman v Superman was that it was a bit dreary or a bit too dark when you have Batman and Superman and Superman being one of the lighter and there wasn't a lot of fun. Not everybody feels that way, but that was one of the criticisms. I don't think that Suicide Squad needs to be a lot of fun mm-hmm. and a lot of... It, 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 it can be crazy and kind of black comedy that type of stuff because of the amount of psychopaths you have cracking jokes yeah. i don't want to see a really light and fluffy uh suicide squad it's called suicide squad yeah. so let's stick Good with point. the with the darker tone and leave it alone and don't uh, yeah i just so i'm I, I don't don't just panic because of of what people are saying about a, another movie yeah i echo what christian says i think so too i mean look at a deadpool deadpool's a darker movie on a lot of levels still lighthearted in certain moments but it's got a lot of darkness in that film and the reason people are rebelling against the darkness in in superman versus batman or batman versus superman are different they're different there are different reasons there's issues with story characters, plot, dialogue, what have you. The dark tone itself could have worked with a stronger story, stronger character development, and more believable plot uh, plot twists. And I think with Suicide Squad, you don't have to go lighter. I, we love these characters already, and we want to see them go at it. And if we go lighter, you're going to lose what is the attraction of this, which is the Joker. How can you go lighter on the Joker? And uh, what, are you doing Cesar Romero next? Go for it. What's wrong? All right. I just want to say I disagree with you about Deadpool. It's not a dark film. It's, it's an a, R-rated film, son. It's, it, wait. It's violent. It is a violent film, so darkness is but not it is not okay. dark. There's know. a big difference. So when you're violent, Batman you're not v dark. Superman right. and, and Man of Steel were dark films. The Dark Knight trilogy, those were dark films. You can have a dark film without it being violent. The violence in Deadpool yeah, but was I didn't gle- say be- Wait, hang on. Okay. Hang on, mister. My turn to talk. Oh, since uh, when? <laughs> since when uh, do you not the, like to get the interrupted? The violence in Deadpool, it was gleefully fun Hyperkinetic violence. It was a fun movie. It was jovial, and honestly, the way that Deadpool, the what, the way that Deadpool was joking around with the wisecracking and everything, and looking into the fourth, breaking the fourth wall, looking into the camera, I felt like they should have done some of that with the Spider-Man movies, because Spider-Man in the comics is a wise ass, and Deadpool like captured that perfectly. What? You can have you can have violent without it being dark. Yo, he gets burnt alive. But that's it's pretty not dark. dark. That's it's dark a, to me. A, I don't know how you view your world, but that's pretty dark to me. And the guy it's going violent, up against but the it's street not dark. Dark. It is F- dark so is, dark. Dark is Batman v Superman, Man of Steel, the Dark Knight trilogy. I would argue. All right, all right, all right. Oh. Hey, you can just go on forever. Um, okay, so we're going to see this a lot tomorrow. Natasha, let's do the last one. Okay, well, this might get them fired up. Oh, oh yes! Right, get right, them right, fired right, up, baby! Right, what but do we got? Christopher S. Brown asks, for Manton Roca, how will you handle it if you do not win? After all, there can only be one. Ah, I love it. Okay, so as this is the last question of the day, so I'm, uh, to let everybody oh, know here. Oh, put the hat on. No, wait, just, and the just, clothes. Just, just wait for a second. Wait for a second. Right, look, so this thing has been going on. If you guys saw the promo yesterday, if you didn't watch Movie Talk yesterday, go and watch it. It's a promo. These guys have been going at it for months. About eight or nine months, this months. thing started on movie fights, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start with John Roca here. Yeah. John, the question on this it was if now you and Mance have been going out. The first thing we want to know is that what happens if Scott Mance beats you? I know you want to take on Riley for the belt. If Scott Mance beats you, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna feel? What's it gonna what's what's it gonna go like? Tell us. To even conceive of that possibility is heartbreaking, heart shattering to me. 
to lose this blowhard once and for all. After I'm all, a blowhard. After all just the him, stuff he's talk, been talking. Talk. See, once again, there he goes interrupting. Uh, it would just destroy me. But, oh God, it would just be such a bitter pill to swallow. No, but you, but you open I will, wide. But I will find a way to come back if I lose because the outlaw it takes his hits, but he keeps on coming. So if the miracle happens that this fool beats me, fool, then what? Then what? Then right. I'll bounce back. I'm not a loser. Why and are I don't you talking like William down. Shatner? Why are you talking? You're supposed to be the outlaw. You do not talk right, like before, Captain Kirk. Before I get to you, I want to see it because this is the same thing we do with you and McGregor right now. Who's gonna win? Mance Roca. Go. All right. Now you okay. Go talk. Listen. First of all, yes, I've had to listen to you talking, to you ranting on Facebook, on Twitter, face mm. to face. You know, you're a big guy. You're loud. You call you know, him fat. But in the Empire Strikes Back, what did Yoda say? Size matters not. For my ally is the Force, and this Force is the Mance Man, the movie Mance. Yeah. I've got I've got this stuff down. Yeah. I haven't had to say too much because I know. I have confidence because I have confidence in my abilities. Ugh. I've been working my whole life to know and love everything about movies. It would be despicable if you beat me. Just despicable. It would if be somehow lovely you and beat delightful me. to finally shut your big fat mouth uh, up. All right. All right. All right. All right. That's it. That's it's a meal, man. It is, that would it just is, get I it's would make split. Me so happy. Assisted living. Shh, 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 it's, so happy. It's Enjoy split. the taste of pudding. I Enough. I wish I could have my tongue right now. Stop, stop, stop. All right. So listen. So it is split around the board. There's Mance, there's Rokas. This thing. Is coming to a head finally, so I can get the get it out of my life. Uh, it is going down tomorrow, one, uh, two p.m. PST on Collider Video. Mance versus Roca in the movie trivia showdown. Watch it. I'd like to thank everybody here today. First, he is the Mance Man, Scott Mance. Where can they find you? Well, follow me on Twitter at Movie Mance. Check out my Facebook page, which is Scott Mance. Check out Instagram, which is The Movie Mance. I know I should have just like used Scott Mance across the board. But you can also catch me on Access Hollywood, Access Hollywood Live, and AccessHollywood.com. And the outlaw, John Roca. Where can I find you? Hey, guys, you can always find me at The Roca Says on Twitter and Instagram. You can see all the shows I'm hosting, like the Flash recap show, the Walking Dead recap show on Collider. We've got the big season finale coming up this Sunday. And you can also see all the other shows I'm hosting on podcasts, like the Top Ten show on the Collider Network, Schmozno Network. Is that right? Collider, Schmozno Schmoes Network. Schmozno Podcast Channel. Podcast Channel. And then you can see videos of me kicking the crap out of Mance tomorrow if you follow me because I will post everything that you will see. There'll be nothing left of him. And Mrs. Mance, my name is John. Oh. So oh. you might need someone oh, you are, to dude, take your place. When my I get rid of, wife. Hey, woman. My hey, woman. awesome all right, all right. wife has my back. <laughs> she <laughs> is the greatest thing that has ever happened. Well, this awesome lady. Lady. And she this is awesome hot. lady has my back. All right. My Natasha. red wife. Speaking of the lovely lady, Natasha, <laughs> where can they find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. And you can also find me reading all of your twi twits. <laughs> tweets. <laughs> tomorrow yeah. at the movie trivia showdown so make sure you hashtag schmo down uh, one more thing i just want to give a shout out to my show profiles that yeah. i do with alicia malone Definitely. we're doing our 50th episode this coming tuesday and we are profiling the great denzel washington so yes. please go to our facebook page which is profiles with malone and mance and all the information will be there make sure you like our facebook page as well it's profiles with malone and mance Thank you. Go and on. for me, at Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram, you will see me tomorrow with these two maniacs, as well as Jedi Council. Really cool episode happening today. If you didn't watch our Rebel season finale after show, make sure you check that out. Um, and obviously, you see me here on Mailbag. So do all that. And then I have the poll. It's going to be up there right now between Mance and Roku, who you think is going to win on my Twitter. It is pinned there. Go ahead and check that out. Thank you for joining us. And we'll be back tomorrow. I need a rest. You're dead, Mance. You're dead, Roca. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.